Hello. I haven't been here before, but this is me. My name is Brian Hempel. Uh, that's my avatar on the internet. Um, hopefully you can see the resemblance. Uh, nice to meet you, I work for Clicked Video. Um, so the day, the title of the presentation, if you saw it because I went by it so quickly, was Screening Data from Postgres Land to Ruby Land. Um, and if you haven't done that before, don't know about it before, we're going to try to cover a few things. We're going to do some basics first. First basics is uh, active records find each. What does that do? How is it different from each? And we'll talk about this gem called PostgreSQL cursor um, and how that works. And then uh, we'll get into something a little more detailed. Um, I would call it a real world example of streaming. And then and hopefully from that you can begin to form your opinions of this technique. Uh, this talk came about because a couple weeks ago I wrote a blog post series on optimizing memory usage for Rails actions. Uh, we had an application where the client was an iPad and had to work offline. And that made things a little bit crazy because now suddenly we have to have two copies of data. We have to keep all the data on the iPad and then we have to keep all the data on the server. Um, and we have to sync them together. Um, this is great, and it was fun. It was a fun problem. I enjoyed it a lot. Although we, we did have this little problem: was that um, when the iPad first comes online, it has to download the entire data set from the server. Uh, and if you're not careful about how you do that, uh, you can easily run out of memory on Heroku, which is our problem. We'd get above Heroku's memory limit and start paging, and then Heroku just didn't really reclaim the memory, or Ruby didn't really reclaim it, so we'd have degraded performance. So that turned into this blog post series on uh, tuning memory usage, and unfortunately I was hoping that there was, when I, when I began this, I was hoping that there'd be one easy, simple little fix that would uh, get our memory usage under control. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, it turned out to be about seven or eight fixes and it turned into this blog post series. Um, and streaming, some streaming things are covered there. Uh, I uh, am not gonna cover everything that's covered in the blog post because I just haven't allowed, and I wanna cover some new ground today. So we'll talk about the basics, but then we'll do something a little different. Um, so first of all, is, is what, what is the difference between these two if you do these in Rails? Um, I'm curious, how many people here have used find each in Rails? So about two thirds, or about a third? Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, talk about what goes on there. It's a little code example. All right, so I'm gonna pop into Rails console in this app, and I'm just gonna use this app. We'll see this app more later. And this app has a lot of data in it. Uh, Particularly in this, this particular table here, if I do count on this, there are two, uh, two point eight million rows in this table. So let's let's um let's you know grab out of each row. Let's grab the cell value out of each row. So I'm just going to hit this right here. I'm going to do all all of each. Yeah, just continuity with my last slide. <clears throat> and, uh, well, it, Postgres managed to grab all the records in two and a half seconds, but um, we might wait here for a while. If you notice, uh, so here's my Ruby process. It's using 100% CPU, 2.4 gigabytes fast rising in memory because it's trying to load every single record. Um, it's trying to load every single record into memory before it actually grabs the value out of them. So it's um, this this is a problem if you're working with a lot of data. Instead, Active Record gives us a nice thing called find each. Uh, it'll still t take forever, but it, what it will do, and you can see this, um, is it's actually loading a hundred records at a thousand records at a time, and then feeding them on to your your uh, your enumerator chain. So you can do something um, 
uh, like this, where I can map map survey, and then so um, so let's talk about what's going on here. How many of you use lazy lazy enumerators in Ruby? Two people. Okay. So what lazy enumerator does is usually when you do a map call in Ruby or you do um, select in Ruby, um, it has the entire array in memory. And then it goes through, like, so, so first you do a select, goes through every element of the array, selects the module, and makes a new array. And only after making that new array does it run whatever else you call on it, like map. Um, lazy doesn't do that. As soon as you lazy something, it doesn't run the next commands that you do on it right away. So I can map the cell value, I can uh, I can try and uh, upcase all the cell values, and if I if I return, nothing actually happens. Um, it, it's got this lazy, this enumerator that's just sitting there, and only when I ask for a value out of it, like I asked for the first value, will it go through the chain. It'll grab some records, it'll grab some records with find each, um, and then it will map that first record calling cell value on it. And then it will uh, upcase the cell value, and then it will spit it out. So even though this um, this chain right here would go through all the records in the database, it's only going to grab. It's going to stop after um, first one. So if I hit the first, um, loads a bunch of the records, and then uh, grab the, the cell value out of the first one, upcase the first one, which. Apparently it was a number, so I guess didn't do anything. <laughs> and then, and it spit, it spat it out. So this is really nice if you need, um, say, you need first uh, ten thousand or something like that. Oh, there was a nil in there. Darn. Uh, that's fixable. We'll turn them to strings first. Okay, so now I have the first ten thousand. Uh, cell values in this database. And what was nice is you didn't have to go through, even though, uh, even though this find, this, even though this table has 2.8 2 million records, um, because it's iterating through it lazily, uh, it's able to stop before you get to 2 million. Uh, again, if you tried to do each, um, each will not work, except I hope I got it right. I did. I did get it right. Yeah, so each is not going to work because it has to, again, load the, all the records in memory before it does the next thing on it. So that's, that's active records, find, find each, which is really nice if you need to go through your entire database and do something on every single record. Uh, so you have a nightly job that updates third-party service with information from a user's database. Uh, just do find each on it. This is less memory. Sometimes it's even a little faster. Uh, so that's that's find each. Um, so find each grabs a thousand records at a time, feeds them off, so it doesn't have to load the entire database or the entire query. Um, and we'll get to some problems with find each. So you can do this the streaming stuff we already mentioned on why you might want to do streaming. One is to use to lower memory usage. You don't have to load your entire table before you do something with it. Obviously, you're going to use a lot less memory. Um, and with that, you can actually do some really fancy things where you start streaming a response to the client. Uh, if you want to give the client something that's bigger than it's going to fit in your memory, so you want to do a database dump of, uh, to CSV or something like that, um, if you, use, you can use crazy things uh, with action. Action Controller Live, um, which we're not going to talk about, but I'll give you a reference for that. Uh, the other thing you might want to stream is once you're streaming data out of Ruby, you can work with a lot more. You could, in theory, work with a lot more data. You could have all these records coming in on a stream. You don't have to load them all, and then you have records coming in on another stream. Maybe you merge them. Maybe you use something else, and you're able to write this stuff in Ruby instead of doing crazy uh, SQL things. And that's one promise. Another promise of streaming. Uh, finally, sometimes when you Stream, you actually uh, things actually go faster because uh, you're 
there's less GC pauses because of your memory usage and things like that. Um, but sometimes. All right. FindEach has one problem that I didn't talk about, and that is this. So say uh, I want to order these all by cell value. looks like it worked, but it didn't work. And if you read the SQL that it spits out, you'll see right here, I asked it to order by cell value, but find each ordered it by ID, because find each is provided by Rails, and Rails is trying to be database agnostic. And the way, so the way it does this find each is it actually order, it forces all of your records to come through by ID. It says, sort them by ID. Okay, I'll grab the first thousand, and then after that, I'll grab the next thousand, after that, I'll grab the next thousand, um, and so this is a problem because if every time you want to order something besides ID, you can't use find each. Happily, there is a very, very easy solution to that. Don't look yet. Okay. Very easy solution if you're using Postgres. Use the Postgres real cursor gem. It's so. Um, I'll show you. It's so simple. Uh, all you do is in your gem file. You add PostgreSQL cursor. So now you have PostgreSQL cursor in your gem file. You bundle your gem file, and that, and that gives you uh, some methods that you can use. The methods, the two methods it gives you are they're exactly like Rails as find each, but they let you order. So I can order by cell value, and then uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, each instance. instance <laughs> oh I think I don't have a index on <laughs> on that so that's I was a little confused because, well, let's order by something I have an index well, on. <laughs> I, I can't do it quickly, sorry. Uh, we'll do something I have an index on. That's not nearly as cool, but, okay. Okay. Um, oh, I think it's broken. Let's try again. There we go. Okay. Um, good. So, it um, so PostgreSQL cursor actually actually opens a cursor in a database, and cursor is this thing that sits in the database that says it's kind of like a, a query that can sit around and you don't have to finish it right away. So it'll give you part of the query, and then you can come back and get more of the query, and then you can come back and get more of the query, and and PostgreSQL cursor, you drop in your gem file, you call each inst each instance, and suddenly it works. It gives you Rails objects out, and you can sort by anything you want. Uh, it's Kind of magic. Um, the only thing it doesn't do is preload. Uh, if you're doing something like includes, if you have an includes a, like a comments or something, you can't. It doesn't do that. You have to do that by hand. Um, it also gives you a nice thing called each hash, and that will give you uh, a hash of your record. It's a lot like. How many of you? How many of you? How many of you have used Active Records cluck method? Okay, at least half. All right. Um, use a uh, a table called table. Doesn't have many things. Cluck it just lets you pluck uh, columns straight out of the database. It's very nice, very handy. So uh, if I do pluck, it actually gives me every single uh, record in there as an array. So this is the first column. First cell of that record, second cell of that record, third cell of that record. Uh, what? Oh, this one. <laughs> uh, 
fifth cell of the record. Um, and you can ask it for specific cells. I could do uh, just plucking me the the, uh, the name, and then it gives you all the, the names of all of my tables in the database. Uh, or you can pluck two things. You could pluck created at. Oops. Um, but again, this doesn't. This this uh, this has to load all the all the records before it gives you any data back. So you can't we can't use it on our. Uh, our two point whatever million uh, using on here It'll blow up. It'll take. Um, oh well, that Ruby did a good job of making a two point eight million value array for me. Um, but if you want to just get the first one, you can do each all that each hash, and instead of plucking. You select. What is it, cell here? So that just gives me um, these hashes. It says cell value, and the thing I want is actually the second thing. So the way you can turn it, turn PostgreSQL uh, each hash into active records pluck is to just map these to values. And I have to make this lazy, otherwise it'll go through the whole thing. Yep. So, um, so now I can just get the value of my arrays. arrays. One element arrays. All right. Okay. Um, I said preloaded didn't work. If you go to the blog post, there's a solution for that. Just copy and paste that code. Um, also, I talked about streaming web responses. Just copy and paste code from here. It's it was tedious to figure out, but you just, you just copy and paste the code and it works. Um, uh, so, how much time do I have? How much longer should I take, I guess, is the question. Ten minutes? Fifteen minutes? Five minutes? What's that? Ten minutes? Okay. Okay. So as I was explaining to you, to Stephanie earlier that I had this I wanted to do an example, but I didn't want it to be super simple. Um, unfortunately I, instead I thought it was something super complicated. But uh I'll just do a quick demo of what's going on here. So oh dear, start the server. So I don't. Sorry, don't stop putting my elbow in there. <laughs> All right. So I have here a a website that's not resizing. Um, it's okay. I have a website. Uh, it says tables, new tables, or whatever. So let's click new table. Let's see how this thing works. And what's what's so special about this data management thing? Um, table. Yes. Uh, food choices. How about that? So now I have a table. Uh, I called it West Michigan Ruby Group Food Choices. So maybe we should have favorite food column. So now I have a favorite food column. Let's add another column. Let's name it <laughs> name. Um, and then we'll have another column is. Uh, Times per day that favorite food is mentioned. Okay. Um, so I have some columns. Is that a row? Uh, who has a favorite food? Pizza. Pe yes. <laughs> What's your name? Jason. Jason. How many times per day do you mention this food? Anyone else? Favorite food? Falafel. How do you spell? Okay, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, who? Okay. I don't know. 
good. All right. All right, that's good enough. Um, so you're probably wondering what this stuff is up here. Uh, well, let's click on this guy. It says parent and find out. Oh, Matt, you just appeared. Um, let's click on this guy. Oh, Jason, you're gone. And then let's click on this guy. Oh, our table's going. Looks like our, our table's going backwards in time. Um, so what we're doing, what? <coughs> what we have here is I, this is like, this is git for a table. Um, every time you insert a row or change a column, it makes a commit to your table, and you can rewind your commits. I could go, I could go back here to this, uh, this commit. I can make a new table, so I can fork my table. Food forked. That's like a pun. <laughs> and so if I add another row in here, um, <laughs> uh, okay. um, so now I have this table, and if we look at it, it's different from this one. So even though they have, uh, and if you look in their commits, they're they're based off the same thing right here, this 5.1.d guy. Uh, they're based on 5.1.d, but their next commit is different. So we have a tree of commits going on here. Uh, and so what, what in the world is the problem? Well, OK, so if I click on this, oh, it'll work, because this is the optimized version. But um, this table has 30,000 rows from OpenStreetMap uh, places in Michigan some places in Michigan. So if I click on it, it'll take a few seconds, but it, it'll it'll load the first 250. And if I click on all 30,000, oh, actually, that's not going to. It'll take a minute and a half. That's OK. I clicked on it. We'll get back to it. Um, and so I guess what I want to, what, so this, the way I'm making this work, OK, I'll explain how it's working, and then I'll explain the problem. And then I'll at least show you the code and why I put this back here that Streaming may be an anti-pattern, because it can really make things nasty. Um, so remember how git works. You start with git makes snapshots of your working directory. And so for us, we're going to make snapshots of our tables and what they look like. Um, and then you make a new snapshot, and it's based off of a previous snapshot. And then someone else comes along, you make a new snapshot, it's based on the previous snapshot. Change some things. A new snapshot, it's called a commit, previous snapshot, so on. But but you know, you can have you can have different branches and you can go back, you can go back a few and actually start from you can rewind history and then start anew from wherever you are in history. Uh, and take take snapshots. So for so for our table we get this tree structure of the changes that have happened to uh, three tables, and at the very top we have one dummy root commit that does that everyone starts from, all the tables start from. And then you can keep going, making more changes from wherever, from any of these places, and you could switch back and forth between. Um, I have no mouse. Well, between this guy and this guy and this guy, and, this is it. and each of those are, are can be changed independently, even though they share some history. Uh, so in the database, how am I going to represent this in a, in a database so that I can make uh, these tables that can be changed? And so what you do is you have your commits, and your commits have a parent commit. That's what those, those big gray arrows are. Each commit has a parent commit. And then each commit has some changes that happened within that commit. Um, and there's two, two times of changes we care about for, for the demo example. Uh, one are the, the cell changes. I'm actually doing the changes by cell, not by row. Uh, the reason for that is so that we can sort by cell value. And there's two changes that can happen in a cell. You can create it, or you can update it. Let's see. So you put a bunch of these, these little change records into, uh, into the commit, and that represents the changes on the database. You can also have a row change. The only row change that we have right now, we need right now, is to delete a row. It doesn't make sense to delete a cell, because you're always going to delete an entire row. Okay, so when I started out with fairly unoptimized, where it runs, 
um, it just loads the entire table into memory by starting at the very bottom commit and walking through every single commit, applying the changes, walking through every commit, applying changes, and it builds up this huge table in memory. Um, it took about 850 megabytes of memory in about 10 seconds to um, perform this action. And uh, in the interest of time, okay, I will, we're not going to go through the entire optimization process, but I want to show you what it looks like before and what it looks like after. Let's see here. Let's check out. Okay. Okay. This is the appropriate method. So to make the rows for my table, uh, I grab grab the columns, don't worry about that. But what I do is I go through each cell change that belongs to this table. And for each one, um, I go through each change and I say, okay, is it a create change or is it an update change? Actually, those are the only changes. That condition is superfluous, but and then um, I see if that row already exists by looking at the row ID on the change. If the row already exists, I don't need to do anything, so this thing enters into the row variable. If the row does not exist, the or equal clause comes in and I make a new row. Because if I see a cell, that means the row exists, because I don't actually have row create or row update changes. Um, and then, now that I have a row, I, uh, I change the cell value in the row. So I look up the cell in the row that matches the column for that cell, and then set the value on that row cell. Uh, and that gets loaded up into this big hash where the keys of the hash are the IDs of the rows and the values of the hash is the row itself. Uh, and you have to install, when you're done, the entire table that's displayed on the web is stored in this hash. Uh, so after I go through all the cell changes, I need to remove the rows that have been deleted. So I go through each of the row changes and I look at the row ID on the change and you delete it out of uh, and then we just kind of sort it really and take a take a thousand or take the whole thing. And that's this takes ten seconds and eight hundred and fifty megabytes of of memory. Uh, so I got it down to with some crazy streaming things, I got it down to this. You can see the memory has improved a lot. About three and a half seconds. Uh, it's not not great, still terrible. I would not production quality. No one would want to actually store a lot of data in the system. Um, but just to show you what that looks like. So that, so again, this method, this row method, um, it kind of fits on the screen here. It starts here, ends here. Uh, now let's start now with the streaming stuff. It starts here. And it ends here. So uh, there is a uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, five steps. It's a uh, it's, it's pretty nasty stuff, but it keeps the memory down. Um, and then just to get a sense of it, let's go through the first one, and then we'll call it uh, call it a day. So the goal here, the goal here was that if I only want 250 rows out of my table, I should be able to, you know, maybe only get 250 rows out of the database. That's ideally, what I want to do. I don't have to. I don't want to have to go through the entire database. I want to. I want to use an order column, order by the what I want, and then go through. Um, like for example, for this one, okay, I'm just 250, so it actually loads. Um, then if I want to sort by the place, the name, let's just sort by the name. Actually, no, let's sort by timestamp. What's the earliest thing that someone added here? South Leon. So because I'm only displaying 250, I don't want to have to load the entire 30,000 rows. And how in the world are we going to do that? Um, 
And the way we do that is we start with a cursor on the cells. And we grab the cell changes that are in the column we're going to sort by. And then we will order them in the direction we want. And then it goes on from there. And I don't remember what the rest of this does. Yes. That's right. So I want to Left commit ID. Yes, I remember. Oh, yes. So, um, this is why we do this. So, you get the cell changes, you get the cell changes in order, and you have the value on that cell change. Like, this, this is at some, we know that at some point in time, this cell was changed to a value. Unfortunately, we don't know if this is the most recent change to that cell because it could have changed value five or six times. This may be the only third change or whatever. So, we have to still got, we have to get the commit ID out of it. Um, and this is the just the pluck thing, the PostgreSQL pluck, uh, so we can get row ID and the row ID and the commit ID out of it. Uh, and then this is because PostgreSQL cursor does not return things in nice uh, formats sometimes, uh, but uh, it's okay. We survived. So now that we have that, we we're starting to get row ID. We're get, what we're basically doing is we're getting candidate row IDs in order. We start to filter them, make sure that uh, they're actually part of the table, make sure that they're the most recent, uh, and then remove the deleted ones. And then finally, we still at this point only have row IDs. We don't actually have the entire rows, so we have to go back to all the cells and grab all the cells in that row with the most recent change from each. So, so this is why I say that streaming can kind of be an anti-pattern, because look at this mess. Um, I, I would... If it's simple and streaming makes sense, then do it simply and do it streaming. But if it's complicated, then um, try to simplify it. All right. So, uh, so that's that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you followed some of it. Any questions? Yes. So, when I learned any. Maybe I'll think, I really don't know JavaScript as well as I would like to. I'm going to go read the JavaScript book. And the other way is I come across some problem that like, I never had encountered or problem that type before. Mm -hmm. And so then I can go and research a potential solution to that problem, and that's how I learned something. And I'm curious, because there were like a lot of things that I wasn't previously familiar with. Is that stuff that you just happen to know, and then here is a place you know, how to apply it to the thing process challenge, or did you specifically go and seek out those things when you're presented with this challenge? Yeah. Uh, so I've been doing Rails stuff for a couple of years, and I think you just some of it you just pick up along the way by reading articles and um, and things, and then some of it is challenges that you come across. A client comes up and says, you need to be able to uh, get some analytics out of the database. A pluck happens to be really, ni really nice for that, because you don't have to just put a single column there. You can put a whole select clause, a SQL select clause, and you can say, like, pluck distinct, um, pluck distinct user ID or something like that in your pluck statement. And so, so it's kind of, you hear that, oh, pluck has been added to Active Record. This is really nice. And then you keep using it. You keep seeing more examples of it. And that's where that's kind of where it came about. The PostgreSQL cursor thing. I don't know. That might have been a Google search. But it, but it was that problem where I needed to stream and I couldn't order by. I thought I needed to stream and I couldn't order by anything other than ID with find each. Did you already know about uh, PostgreSQL cursors at that point? No, I didn't. I had no idea that I had cursors, and I would never. I'm glad someone else wrote that gem because that seems like something that would be painful to write. Uh, and I'm glad it just works for the most part. Did you see any reasons why one of the things you find it messed up up in Rails too much, or other kinds of 
Um, yeah, I think there's a couple things. One is it's actually a little slower than find each, so they didn't want to just bother to find each in many cases. But, um, but you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's astronomically slower than find each. It's just in some cases it can be a little slower. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, and then I think find each, if you look at the find each source code, it's, it's very, yeah, you'd have to, <laughs> you'd be clobbering a lot of Rails and stuff. And that just, that just ends up making your life difficult when Rails changes. Now your gem doesn't work. So you get more longevity out of your gem if you don't override what Rails is doing. They've probably been around a long time. It's kind of a it's kind of a database feature that I think a lot of databases have. So right. you, yeah, you don't. Yeah, but I remember doing some stuff in PL SQL and uh, I don't. I think it must have been an Oracle database. I didn't really know what I was doing. This was a long time ago when I was a freshman in college or something. I got hired for this job and I just, here go work on this thing and copy-pasted code and eventually figured out what was going on. But they had cursors and that you can you just that's that's how you say that you're gonna walk over a query is you say, ah, give me a cursor and then now you're able to get the results out of it. And, and uh, that was did I say PL SQL? Yes, that's correct. It was PL SQL. Not PG SQL. Any other questions? Nope. Uh, yeah, I just pushed it, Victorian, so you can you can fork it, play with it, try and make a product out of it. There are some bugs. Uh, <laughs> 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 yep. All right.